we, we are live on Oz from Investor. We bring the big names and we have the big fun. And we've just been talking, strategizing. I wish we, it was an exciting sort of pre chat. How are you going anyway, Ash? How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm well. Thanks, Jeff. That's, that's, I look, yeah, I'm, I'm, ex, I'm excited for this. And the crowd has been going wild as well. I'm sure there's been baited breaths. Where, when, when are they going live? When, when, are they, when is it going to happen? Because you've been, you've been creating a storm. So, and there's, there's plenty of interest in Perth. It's, it's really hot over there, probably in more ways than the temperature as well, property wise. So, how are you going anyway, Joe? What's happening? Hey, I'm fabulous. I am. I'm very good. We're actually looking to buy some property over in Perth. Um, so, I am excited to unpack this chat with 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 Ashley and learn a little bit more about this this Western state um, and what's going on and and what are the, what are all the insights that's going to happen over there, um, mate. But I've been I've been good, mate. How are you? More importantly. I feel I, f- I feel busy and I, I feel very admin admin driven, which which is, is my kind of jam as well. So, I'm uh, yeah, I'm I'm loving sort of being able to 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 look at property full time and just do all that sort of stuff. So it's great. Yeah. But um, for those who drop drop a comment, drop a question about Perth, because we're going to talk about suburbs. There's plenty of things we're going to be talking about. So if you've ever had a burning question, let us know and we'll do our best to get to it. And well, I just think also it- YouTube. Yeah, okay. oh yeah, join YouTube, smash that like, subscribe, and do all the trendy stuff that the kids are doing nowadays. Um, but more importantly, as oldies, um, Perth, it's, it's a whole new world over there. Um, I think there's a whole heap of different trends going on. And, and I think if you are from the Eastern states and you put your Eastern state hat on and expect to get the same results out over in that market, Things are done a little bit differently. There's different legislations. There's different way that contracts work. Um, mm-hmm. There are different ways that the property management world is set up um, over there as well. So you can't just go over there expecting to get, you know, you know, you don't, you, you know, being bang on close to the train station might not actually be a benefit. Now that's just a generalization, um, but there are a whole heap of trends, whole heap of different locations and opportunities over there, and uh, I'm pumped for this one i'm i'm excited so to give, to give us a quick quick run through to to build it up before we go into quote of the week we're going to be talking about uh the insights as to what is perth is all about giving a high level overview and then we're going to talk about the sort of things that people love so they want to know about <laughs> the suburbs that are trending so to speak um from a property management perspective so three to four hundred k ash has broken it then into about sort of 450 to 500 or was it four and then sort of 500 to 600 and then we can even look above 600, I believe, it. but um, if anybody's looking at that. So sh- without further ado, let's get into quote of the week. So what is your quote of the week, Young Ash? Mine is, don't fear failure, fear being in the exact same place next year as you are today. Ooh. Ooh. Who, who, who's, who's, who's that quote by, anyway? I do not know from Pinterest um, <laughs> is where it comes from, but I do like it, but I... I but I, I hope that's in style with your quotes. Like I don't know what quotes you tend to use, whether you do funny ones or serious ones. But no, I I Google my quote five seconds before we go live. Um, so my quotes have very little value. Um, but Jeff puts a little bit more effort in, in, in into them. But I do love that one because I actually think about that um, the similar way. Like a lot of the things that I like uh, is is you against you. It's you just trying to be better and beat yourself. I'm not trying to beat the competition. I am trying to be the best investor that I can be so I can get the best results for, for me. Um, and I think that rather than looking external, seeing what is everyone else doing, how are they performing, how are they acting, it's like, no, how can I optimize and get my strategy better? And so I'm all, I'm all about that quote. I yeah, love it. And I, think, I think that's very... Oh, Every well, I was just gonna say everyone's investor journey is so different and mm. um, so unique and so all that's important. The way that I interpret that is that you just you just have to do it an extra ten percent each year, whether it's personally or professionally or you know with investments as well. But just that little bit extra each year, so that you're always going in the right direction. I feel is really important. Yeah, that's Static a great is little, failing. Static is failing. Sitting still is is not moving forward. It's moving backwards. Well played. I like that. That's my favorite quote that we've had on. I think up there um, um Jeff, what is your quote of the week mate let's let's I was, let's do it yeah I was, I was listening to Brene Brown on on Tim Ferriss before this and daring greatly and all that sort of so it sort of feels very Brene Brown-esque but I my quote of the week is probably not as interesting as that 
Um, but similar similar vein to somewhat, it's by Mr. Albert Einstein. So he's um, an interesting little bloke, that guy. But he said, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is to not is not to stop questioning. So I think that that's sort of because everybody sort of has an opinion about which where the hotspots are, where the not spots are, as out sort of Perth being a one a one sort of economy town, all that sort of thing, which mm. I think is important to question these assumptions. And I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but I just think if if that is the generally accepted principle, what what data, what information is backing it up? So to sort of, yeah, I thought it was topical given we're talking about Perth. Love that. I'm all for it. My quote, um, it was actually quite hard. I was trying to find a quote that had talks about the distance between Perth and Sydney and Melbourne and Queensland because I feel like we're very state orientated over it. Like there's a lot of investors in 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 the, the eastern states and we don't necessarily understand the western states. So I was trying to find a quote that talked about distance and I couldn't really find one. But it says time is the longest distance between two places. Um, and like Columbus, uh, Tennessee Williams, the glass oh. menagerie. So I don't know what that is. Um, we might end up scrapping quote of the week because I feel like sometimes I, I don't bring the thunder as much as I <laughs> as much as I should do. Um, but one thing, one thing, people get yeah, three hours behind as well. That's a very good point. You're you're. Uh, you're in your early afternoon now, aren't you? Aren't you, Ash? <laughs> yeah, four forty-seven. There you go. Um, but why I'm excited is I think property managers don't actually get the props that they they deserve when it comes to like property investment. And um, you guys are on the ground, on the coal face of all of these locations. You're walking through every single property, and then you see what are these investment? What's going on? Like what what is this? tenant looking for what is this demographic mm -hmm. looking for what is this you know family makeup looking for what are the stuff that's staying on the market for bloody ages and i can't I, you know struggling to rent um mm -hmm. so i think there's so many value valuable um points that you can pick up from a property manager and uh, i love it yeah I, and i always start off um the conversation with all my clients is that right now in perth every single property just about will rent out with no problems at all um, yeah. and anything you buy is going to rent out but it's really important to have um, a you know a professional property manager or a buyer's agent to actually um, have a look at the property to make sure that the rentability factors there in the future or in a changing market and that's really where I try to specialize in making sure that is this property going to be in demand in the future in a changing market mm -hmm. or just right now because I think that's the most important thing that people need to know and the um the best person to really do that is the person on the ground and the person who is experiencing tenancies you know we're showing hundreds of people through properties every day we know exactly what they're looking for what they're not looking for the psychology behind the marketing and you know and tenancy um tenancies as well so it's um that's really where i try to complement my work in align with the client's data analytics, whether it's something that they personally research themselves or if they use a buyer's agent, I just try to complement it with that on the ground rentability now and in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that on the ground stuff is so, so crucially important um, because not a lot of people do it. I bet you, I bet you speak to people that are just, oh, no, I just, you know, I bought this one site unseen and, and had no idea what it was. And then you go there and you're like, oh, sorry to tell you, this is a, you might not put it this bluntly, but yeah, this is a dive. You shouldn't have bought. This is not a good investment. Um, oh no, you're being you're being polite, Joe. I probably say worse <laughs> than that. <laughs> I, I've been known to say um, I've I've caught up one client before, and I said, if you buy this property, I'm not looking after it. It's crap. <laughs> I've been known to say I won't let my mum buy it, and I'm going to leave that that's with a you. Good, I don't. Think that's a good witness test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, the, tr the truth is with buying is that um, you can buy sight unseen, like no problems at all. You can do that. But I think the key word is in it is that you can't buy confidently. So you can't buy confidently mm -hmm. unless you've had someone mm -hmm. look at it on your behalf. And, and that, that really is the key word. So there are definitely clients who buy sight unseen still. And that's cool. But that's probably more for a client that maybe has a little bit of a buffer 
financially, um, doesn't mind if the property manager says, hey, you're going to have to get the house repainted and it's going to cost $8,000. If that doesn't bother you, then sure, you might be more comfortable buying site unseen. We really are being very careful with the dollars and making sure that this works out financially. You sort of want to know those expenses prior to putting in an offer. Um, so you need someone. I will go through mm. and um, say, listen, it needs a paint. That's going to cost about 8000 It needs a new vanity. That's going to cost you 2500 And it needs um, this done. And it's going to cost you that. So that when you put an offer in, you're taking that into account. But like I said, if you don't, if you're not worried by those um, potential um, last minute expenses, then sure, you know, that is an option. Yeah, I think the other thing that's quite powerful and that is a bit annoying about some WA properties is you don't have floor plans. So you really, to you, you sort of have to it look at me. the photos and trying to piece it all together. Where Where is what and what does it look like? And where can, some do, but yeah, if you could sort of get that fixed up, that would be great. I'm not, I'm not saying yeah, I mean, I, 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 Jeff, I think we're just getting to a point where we're, we're now always doing professional photography. Like we've moved just to that <laughs> point and we're not past that point yeah. yet. Some properties still don't have professional photos. Um, floor plans, it's not something that's a big thing here because I guess it's just an extra expense for the, the client that they don't, you know, that they don't bother with. But it is important because I have seen properties, for example, where you can only access the patio or the outside back area through a bedroom. And that's not suitable mm. because a tenant's going to have an issue with that. Really, you need to have access to an outside patio area, ideally through a living room um, yeah. or as a worst case option through a laundry, which is not ideal, but it's an option. But there are some properties. And as an investor looking online, you wouldn't even think to check that because you would just yeah. assume you you can access see a outside. room. That's, that's right. So it's little things like that along the way um, that a floor plan would definitely help with. I think it has both sides though, because I, I bought a property as an investor. Um, I bought a three bed, one bath and I got it inspected. I got my, um, I, I did the, the whole video and everything. And I'm like, hang on, do I just count four rooms and two bathrooms? Like the, the agent just looked on what was on RP data, but the person did extensive renovations, added an extension, created another bedroom, created another bathroom. And I bought this three bed, one bathroom for, you know, 560 in a, in a, in a very nice pocket. Um, Changed the thing on RP data to four bed, two bath from three bed, one bath, and now worth 610 instantly. Like, so I think there's a disservice that's done on both sides. So it's not like just greedy investors trying to get the best, you know, optimize and do that kind of stuff. It's like the vendor, the vendor is going to benefit as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, before we, before we dive in a little bit more, let's, um, but we got to introduce you, Ashley. Who is, Ashley Good. The sponsor, oh. Joe. What about what about we gotta pay the bills, Joe? Oh, someone's <laughs> gonna oh god. These these guys pay us way too much money, so we have to uh we have to sell our souls. No, they're they're wonderful guys and we love them. And uh um let's talk about our wonderful sponsors and then we will introduce the amazing Ashley Goodchild. <laughs> Sounds good. This live session is sponsored by Scott Agate from Hello House. Scott has created the world's first property negotiation as a service business. So what does that mean? Well, let's think about it. When was the last time you negotiated on anything over $100, let alone a property that is going to be one of the biggest investments of your life? The vendor, they have a trained negotiator on their side in the form of a real estate agent. That's kind of like you stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson after never training a day of boxing in your life. These guys are trained professionals and that's what they do day in and day out. And this is what Hella House does every single day as well. They negotiate on property to get the best buy price from the real estate agents. Scott Agate, he's the expert negotiator. He has been in this industry since 1995. He owned and operated three Bell franchises. Scott was the guy that was teaching these real estate agents all these agent games. He knows all of their tricks. Having him on your side is going to give you a massive unfair advantage and literally save you tens of thousands of dollars. Unlike other ways of purchasing property, Scott's incentives are aligned with you, the buyer, meaning the more money he saves you, the more money he makes, which is what you want. You need to have those incentives aligned. Scott has kindly offered our group a massive discount on the retainer fee for his service. So if you're looking to buy your next home or investment property, click the link below to get in touch. And we are back. Here we are. 
So Jen, Jenny's, Jenny Mole has asked a great question as well, but I think we might have to, Jenny, we will answer that question. But who, who do we have standing, the, the person of the hour, well, person of the hour and a half, however long this goes for, could be a while. We have Miss, uh, we have Ashley Goodchild and you have more than 20 years of, ex, of experience in real estate and a knowledge and, and passion for, to, to mentor others as well. You've, you've got that fantastic PM Collective podcast, which I'd highly recommend people have a listen to um, and, and, and check that out. But you've also worked, I think the thing that I find most interesting and, and most inspiring about your story is you work from the reception desk to, to the being one of the directors of, of Soco Realty. So, um, I mean, you, I think that's, that's sort of amazing that you've done that. Like it's very, very uncommon these days to hear people sort of worked in, um, work, for, work their way right up the sort of chain. And, and I think something, I saw this on your website, it says that something you love is having an empty inbox and time to enjoy baking. So how good is having an empty inbox? Inbox zero. That's, it's, I, I, it's not empty at the moment, but I aim for it. Yeah. But um, I, I think the thing with that is uh, inbox zero, just before, and we'll get on to Perth wrap around and sort of around the grounds. Inbox zero doesn't necessarily mean you have literally have zero emails in your inbox. It's more about having action, like done something with or, or sort of either replied or just sort of thought, okay, I'll get somebody else to sort that out. So that's inbox zero to me rather than, but the crowd is going wild. So enough from me. So shall we get into around the grounds of Perth and sort of legislation, what you're seeing? So could you take us through a very high level? So around yeah. Perth, so you got, yeah. where do you want to start? I think, that's, I think that's, I think it's awesome just to set the framework to understand Perth, pretend I mean, a bit, you know, a bit, yeah, to pretend, yeah, to pretend you're a Martian, pretend you're someone from Sydney or Melbourne and you're coming into Perth for the first time. Um, and how should we think about Perth as a, as a region uh, um, and States. market as, a, as yeah. well? Yeah. So basically, Perth is really divided into two sections. You've got north of the river and south of the river, and that's how we sort of separate. And we're very, um, we are very uh, protective of whether we're north of the river people or south of the river people. So that's which is as the a best general, south? north or south? Hey? Which is the best well, north or south? Uh, do you know what? Uh -huh. I've always been south, um, particularly in a city south. So it's sort of like right on the cusp. Right now I'm north, but I'm north because of love and not necessarily because I, I want to be. But, from you know, I always try to give professional and personal opinions. Um, professionally, um, north is really great at the moment as well. But ultimately we've got the two pockets and we are seeing very distinctive, which we'll go through later, really distinctive um, suburbs and trending suburbs for everyone. But for us, um, you know, the western side, obviously closer to the ocean, is definitely super popular. Um, mm -hmm. We, in general... We have a nice, we've got lots of expansions happening with our train lines. So that natural infrastructure improvement is fantastic. We're seeing our freeway being extended. Um, I think there's a lot of really awesome um, stuff that's happening in Perth that's going to add value to living here. I find that we have got a lot of people moving to Perth. Um, there's a lot of interest in people re-establishing here, whether it's from overseas. Um, I find that um, that, you know, even international students with our unis and all of that, like we're, it, it's, we're so close to, um, to, um, to sort of the northern countries where we, like, you know, even like with Singapore and all of that, we, we, we are attracting a lot of students, which is really fantastic for um, our industry, but also with our mining as well. We have, like today I spoke to a guy that came into the office and he's relocating from Queensland to Perth because it's just going to make it easier um, for them. Over um, COVID, the people, the workers that were FIFO were also incentivized to move and base themselves over in Perth. And um, while it might be a bit of a, a touchy subject, but I think that WA did a really great job with protecting us, uh, you know, as a state during COVID. And I think economically, um, we were very fortunate that um, our businesses and our, um, you know, as a whole, we, I feel like we survived pretty well um, and we're very lucky to sort of um, to be strong in that sense um, from, um, you know, from a business point of view anyway. I, I was very thankful. So 
I feel like, um, you know, there is a rental crisis um, generally. However, one thing I would like to get across is that people still are not prepared to overpay for a rental. Um, and I think we sometimes get clients that call us up and say, well, it's a rental crisis. I can ask whatever I want. It's actually not the case. People are still smart enough not to overpay. Um, and we um, just need to be mindful of that as well. Um, generally speaking, a rental suburb that has less than five properties available for rent is considered very hot and you are likely to get over and above, um, you know, potentially the asking price on that property. People in Perth can offer over and above the asking price for an investment um, for a rental property. Um, so if you have a suburb that has potentially 10 or more um properties available for rent when yours is being listed it's still a pretty tight like a pretty good market but um probably more likely just to get people offer the asking price and then there's some suburbs where they've got over 20 to 30 properties available still leasing out really quickly but um but definitely um i'm just mindful of that that people aren't going to necessarily offer too much or i don't think they're going to offer over and above when there's a lot more stock available so i think if people sort of know those figures and those numbers um then they can sort of try and keep an eye on what the rental market is doing for the suburb of interest and aim for a suburb with under five properties available for rent. Is, is the best way to look at that via, do you just jump on realestate.com or how, what's the best way of sourcing that data? Yeah, yeah realestate.com is, um, is you know, the most popular website over here. I think that you guys over East probably use domain a lot. Um, I would say realestate.com is the one that you want to be active on and setting up your notifications. D domain has better... Platform. A better Real interface, just but, better. Oh, yeah. I hate going on domain. I mean, I have to because there's some yeah. deals that don't get listed. Some, some, you know, that, and that's a good thing for investors. <laughs> Always check both platforms because some, exactly like what you're talking here, Ashley. Some agents are like, no, I'm 100% only real estate. And then the vendor's like, well, I don't want to pay for two platforms. I don't want to pay for domain and real estate. And then people are like, oh, I love domain. And then you get stuck on there. So you have to always look on, um, look on both. Um, I guess one of the one of the things I kind of think about Perth is it's it, from an investment perspective, and, and you can talk to this as much as you as you as you can. But um, how it's it's hasn't done it great. If we look back ten years ago, um, property prices have been on the on the decline for quite a while, and we're starting to now starting to hit that peak. Like how how is this time? Well, actually, this is probably, sorry, I'm, I'm asking another question, but Jenny came up with a great question here. I'd love to hear Ashley's thoughts on what's driving the current market. Do you think it's different to the previous booms and busts? And if so, why? Um, yeah, I, I feel like that um, I think there are so many factors and I just recently did an article on... Um, on divorce rates over during COVID, 80% of applications that came through were from people separating, you know, and we are now looking, I, and so I think the, the market being the market um, and being strong at the moment is driven by that supply and demand. Um, I feel that we don't have enough houses, our building industry is too slow. Um, and we are finding that families are needing two houses because they've separated instead of one. I, that's, I'm, I'm a big believer that's one of the bigger factors and the stock levels are just low. And, you know, um, naturally, um, naturally, that's creating a lot of interest. In regards to why, you know, the investor activity started July a couple of years ago why that started then I actually don't know I, I don't know what was driving it then all I know pre-COVID or 2020 was it no I no I think um what I'm seeing like I don't know why the interstate investor activity has become strong I I I don't know that, um, but I know that it was ridiculous a couple of years, you know, it started a couple of years ago. And I genuinely at the time thought, you know what, this might last for a few months and then we'll be, you know, not worry, you know, it'll be gone. And it's still happening now. It's still as strong as it was back then. Um, well, from my point of view, it is. Um, the So from a, um, from a market point of view, 
in Perth, we had a 30% drop in rental um, values back in about 2014, 2015. And I feel like that was a really sore point for investors. Um, that really hurt them where, you know, you were renting out your property um, for 450 per week and all of a sudden it was down to 300 per week. It was really, really bad. And so... What drove yeah, that? Was it supply of new stock? Or because there was a lot too, of big too buildings? Too much available. Up? Yeah, just, just too much available. And it, it really did drop. So that put a real dampener in, in um, you know, a real negative association with being an investor in their locals' minds. And then when COVID happened, it was really tough for them. It was a second blow for them in somewhat a short, um, you know, um, time frame. And so during COVID, where we weren't allowed to breach tenants for, you know, um, rent, tenants were taking advantage, um, not all of them, but, you know, there's always a few, that it became really difficult. And so then when the market, they could see it picking up a little bit, but I just feel that the local investors were just really quick to get out of the market and use the opportunity because they've just been burnt twice in less than 10 years. And I think that, that they just thought, you know what, I can't be bothered with this anymore. So started selling it and they sort of didn't really care what they sold it for. They just sold it low mm. just to get rid of it. Um, and then the it's investor the activity over started coming and buying everything. And then because people the locals were selling properties that were tenanted um those tenants were out yeah it's just a, it was just a big vicious cycle so um i do feel like things like divorce rates um affected it i feel that the fact that fifo workers were incentivized to move over to perth um they also needed accommodation so that was a factor um we had a lot of rentals that went off the market um off the long-term market and went into an airbnb short-term option that took properties away and we were just left with a very, very low stock. And then everyone got excited because rents were going up quite a bit as well. So I've seen, there's I've a, seen the background. Joe's looking it up. What do you, what do you, what do you see, oh, Joe? I haven't, haven't quite worked, worked it out, but I've, I was just looking at um, number of marriages registered in 2020. Oh. Like It was pretty steady as she goes and then COVID hit. And uh, people were like, you know what, marriage is... You know, it could be better. It's because you <laughs> couldn't get married, Joe. You I'm want not, to have the I'm big ceremony. Sure. You want I to know. have. I know. I haven't been able to go there. Like I was just looking at it as a side, Sorry. as a side, as a but, side. But, um, <laughs> but we're, we're talking about people. Like I remember someone. They had been married for twenty five years, and it was all amicable. They were just like, we just decided we don't like each other anymore, so we're just going to separate. I was like, oh, okay. It wasn't anything, you know. Um, it, it wasn't malicious. It was just a fact of life. And um, and and it's interesting. This article that I wrote um, was talking about how, like, when you've got that family, and then they're needing two family homes now, where. Um, because they, you know, people are more likely to have 50-50 custody of children. So both, fam both parents need a decent sized home as opposed to the family home holding the children for the majority of the time. And then the other partner to only need a one bedroom unit or something smaller. That's not that's not happening. It's sort of two big family homes. It's just it's really interesting. I just find that that for me is a, is a really big factor. Mm, it's super interesting. So are you seeing... Because that would be a mixture of local investors, local buyers, local owner occupiers um, that are trying to be tenants and buyers um, versus interstate investors. Like, I guess as an as an investor, one of the biggest things is you don't want to be the one holding the bag. You don't want to be going to a market that's purely in an investor market. All the investors are flooding there, pumping up pumping up this place, and it's going for four fifty five six. Well, maybe not those, maybe not that quick, but for you know, four twenty four sixty, and it keeps climbing, climbing, climbing. You don't want to be the last one stuck there. Um, are you seeing like a, a a stable amount of people coming that are both locals and investors, or, or I don't know, maybe talk to that. Yeah, so the home opens that I've been doing, I'm definitely seeing a good healthy mix. I'm not seeing it to be, I'm, I mean, obviously I'm seeing a lot more property managers attending these home opens for investors, but I'm definitely seeing a good healthy amount of um, local buyers as well. Um, I had a chat to a sale, local sales rep and was asking him a similar question. Um, buyers, agents, local um, 
owners wanting to live in the property and then investors. And I asked him if any category was potentially pushing prices up or if any category was more willing to pay more for a property. And he said no. He said that he's really seen consistency along all three categories and all really prepared to pay a very similar amount. We're not seeing, you know, the investor willing to pay more than the first home buyer or, and we're not seeing the buyer's agents paying more. Like we're not seeing any, um, yeah, everyone's pretty consistent and fair with what they're offering. Um, and definitely when I do home opens, I'm seeing consistency with um, with the, the, the people coming through. I'm definitely seeing probably a few more properties being sold, um, sold without even having the opportunity to um, view the property, which is mm. a bit hard. And when I asked that question to this sales rep, he just said, listen, it's generally with properties that have got tenants in where it's sort of hard for accessing and the owner just needs to sell and it's just an easy option because they do a walkthrough. They only bother the tenant once um, and then um, they, they, they're they able to sell it. Interesting. A, a question I wanted to ask about where you sort of see the markets, rental market at least, in, in the next sort of, I, I know it's a crystal ball question, but six or 12 months, where do you sort of foresee that do you see any slowing down? or? What, have... I would like to see the... When we can start building homes within six or 12 month timeframes, I think we'll start seeing a bit of a better improvement in the rental market. Until yeah. that, I, I just can't see how it can get any better. Like, I just, I think it's going to be very, very tight for renters. I feel really, it's really, really hard for them. Um, and it's, um, I, yeah, I, I honestly don't see it improving until we can start getting these these new estates and these homes being built in a timely fashion. Maybe some more grants, you know, that, you know, finance people offer and all of that as well um, to try and get people to be able to buy with, you know, 5% deposits or whatever it might be. So that would be, that would be good. But no, I think it's looking, un unfortunately, for um, for tenants, but uh, it's um, or for renters, uh, it's looking still very, very strong for investors. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of a shift in um, borrowing capacity. So I'm finding that, you know, yields are still pretty consistent and the performance of rent opinion versus what people are buying for has been consistent for the last couple of years. I actually feel like it's been pretty pretty solid um i am seeing as we get a little bit higher in the the budget though the yields are coming down um a little bit there but it's it's still pretty strong but consistent and um and no different to six months ago but um so i was just going to mention that the borrowing capacity i have seen drop a little bit so if i have had a client with a 450,000 budget they might now have a four hundred thousand dollar budget so that has shifted a little bit but that's really the only significant change i've seen for my activity um, with clients I'm dealing with. Just a, it's a bit of a quick economic update. We had inflation come in at 6.8% for, uh, for February. <laughs> so, and that was market expectation was 7.2%. So, I mean, all, all, all steam, I'm not going to, not, don't hold me to it, but it looks like a hold next Tuesday for the RBA, probably. I'm not an economist, so don't you know, put up the disclaimer joke, please. None oh, of this yeah. is financial advice. I'm, I'm not, not going to throw it out there. But yeah, so, and, and there's even been further discussion about the borrowing capacity, sort of APRA re relaxing that back to, from a 3% buffer to a 2.5. So I'll see it when I believe it. But yeah, if that happens, maybe that could free up some opportunity for people, people's borrowing capacities. So hopefully, mm. well, maybe not hopefully. What, there we go. what part of the market are you, are you seeing different segments of the market move at different stages? Like, are you seeing the lower end? Like, let's just break it up into three tiers, the lower end, the middle end, and the, the, the higher end. Are you seeing one segment move harder and faster than the other or are they moving co-current, uh, you know, co-currently, is that a word? Um, um, oh, no, not enough to mention, you know. I think it's all pretty, pretty consistent. I mean, um, yeah, I think it, whether whether it's the three hundred thousand price point or the six hundred thousand price point, they're still selling within days. There's still the same type of demand. Um, yeah, I, I'm not seeing any vast difference personally. Mm, yeah, and I think it's very important. Like having lo local connections as well is is so important for investors, especially in a hot market like this. Like it is 
it is very challenging to go and try and buy a pro- like go on to realestate.com and then under offer 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 yeah. all of them it's just um it's just and, and i think the challenge as well is you, you can end up buying a, a property that yes can can go well from a rental perspective in the current market but when mm. once eventually vacancy rates do sort of tick up a little bit you may sort of see that property sit vacant for two to three months or whatever it is because it's not as desirable as so you just got foam and you bought something because it's the only thing you can pick up because everything else has sold that had more desire to it Desirability. Yeah, I mean, buying properties with opportunities is always a good thing. Um, I I will just mention, like, just because we talked about the interest rates, I am finding that investors do come to us quite a lot and sort of say the interest rate's gone up and now they want to increase the rents. Um, and yeah. that's not really yeah. how rent increases go. So it's very much based on the supply and demand and market conditions as opposed to what your personal expenses have been. So I just wanted to add that in there just for a little bit of education uh, for your clients. But um, but yeah, the having it, there's some properties that we look at where if I think that you could get away with leaving the paintwork, if I think there's a bit of life left in paintwork or blinds or carpet, to be honest, in this market, you could probably get away with it um, in some cases. And I would say, listen, rent it out as is because it's it's fine um, and it won't it'll rent out no problems at all. But it's still good to know if those expenses are something that I if I think that it should be done within a couple of tenancies or if I think it should be done within five years, I will still mention that because I think it's still relevant to that investor when making a decision. So um, I think that most clients I hope would go into an investment understanding, okay, Right now, it's a hot market. I could probably rent it out as is, but I know that in a couple of tenancies or in a changing market, I'm just going to have to redo the flooring or the paintwork or the blinds and spend that mm-hmm. money then, which is that's where buying with an opportunity, that's a great time to be spending the money so that you can get that extra rent um, when there is more stock available and and maybe it's a little bit more trickier to um, lease out. Mm. Great yeah, that's such a great point. What what are the types of properties that what are the things or characteristics that makes a good property from a rental perspective and what are some of the te- the properties that you're seeing that are less uh less desirable and and I don't know if that is going to be different for the different segment sections of Perth as well. Are you what does that look like? Is the Zoom room important as well? That's something that David Oliver asked. A Zoom room. <laughs> Like it works no, for, like it works like you don't even know what that is. <laughs> well, it's because they don't. It's because they don't have floor plans. They don't get creative with in in Sydney and Mel everywhere but WA. They have this little, you know, st- it used to be you know studio because it has a window. It has a like it doesn't have a window. It's connected now. It's called Zoom Room on on the stupid oh, floor plan. So, really? Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that. Before. Um, <laughs> so over, overall, it's it's really simple. Like tenants. Okay. Just one, actually I should use renters because renters is the term I think you guys use over is Renters just want an easy to live in property. And I don't think we should get too caught up with, you know, air conditioning and things like that because you can add that in whenever you want. Like that's just, you know, superficial stuff. That's fine. I think what's really important is having a nice, easy to live in property um, with an easy flow. If I can walk into the property and go, this is easy to live in. And if it doesn't, if I don't have to question how I'm going to live in it, then that's a big tick for me. But the minute a renter goes into a property and goes, oh, how would I fit my couch? Where would I fit my fridge? Would my bed fit in there? Once they start internally asking themselves all these questions, they will start reconsidering whether they want to live in that property. So you really just want to have a property with a nice flow and, you know, something that's maybe, um, I mean, there's unrenovated and there's unrenovated, but, you know, when it's basic, that's totally fine. People don't mind that. But um, the flow um, is definitely important in the layout and just an easy layout. Um, the exterior being accessed through a living or a meals area is, is, I feel, really important as opposed to it being accessed around the side or through a laundry, that type of thing. That will be something that won't feel natural walking through. Um, surprisingly, there are so many properties that don't have a fridge recess. 
and you have to put your and you wouldn't think of looking at it but you'd have to put your fridge in the meals area so that is a, a little bit of a negative that someone would question um the bedrooms being too small or more importantly that main bedroom um but you know what built-in robes you can add a built-in robe if you need to so i wouldn't get too caught up on those things that you can fix i'm more worried about the things that you can't fix or that would be expensive for you too um, hard, hard to fix a fridge recess i mean wait, uh, that's insane like people don't have how did people not have this i mean i suppose you could just put it somewhere but yeah, like I looked at one. I mean, I've seen lots of them that don't have it, but um, there was yeah, there was one where it the fridge had to be placed in like on the side, and that means that it cut off the cupboards because it was like a sort of a gully type kitchen, and then the fridge would cut off part of the access to some of the cabinetry. And sure, you could fix it, but you'd also have to cut away some of your um your cupboards kitchen space. Yeah, it, it's surprising at how often that actually comes up. Um, I like, I like to look inside cabinetry, inside um inside the kitchen cupboards and the bathroom cupboards where we can find that there's a you know water damage. Um, that's an issue because it means that you have to replace the whole carcass. Um, so we're seeing a bit of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, everything else is pretty superficial. Um, in terms of three bedroom, one bathrooms, four bedroom, two bathrooms, I think there's always going to be a need for both. Um, I think there's definitely always going to be a need for affordable housing. So we're looking, when you're looking at a three bedroom, one bathroom, if you've got some, if the property can have a second living area, that would be ideal. So that would mean having a front formal living and then maybe an open plan kitchen mealsy family area. That would be better in a three by one as opposed to a three by one with just one living area. So I'm finding that that is sometimes the thing. Uh, and a patio is always really nice. In WA, we love having a patio where you can sit under. And again, a lot of properties don't have patios. So they're my main focus points that I'm looking at when I'm um, looking through a property. Are there things you that you look at that are like, oh gosh, we can't, this isn't, no, we're not buying this one. This one's not worthwhile. Like, are there any like red, big red flags that we should look at when we're when we're looking at property oh they're pretty obvious like this one that i looked at where to be honest i was really disappointed that the sales agent would have even listed the property i thought it was um it was not wow. suitable to be sold to anyone this is the worst property i've ever looked at and it was a couple of months ago i walked through the property and i'm not kidding you this property had nine broken windows the windows <laughs> oh. were boarded up it had graffiti um, on the exterior wall of the garage. The tenant bailed me up in the bathroom so that the agent couldn't hear her tell me that there had been a previous, a previous gas leak at the property and the owner has had the gas cut off to the property and that's why she's using a gas camper kitchen in her kitchen. She didn't even have an wow. oven. Like, it's, it's obvious. You know, these red flags are obvious. And so... Those properties are not suitable for investors. They're suitable for um, young first home buyers that can do it themselves and and you know spend mm -hmm. time and 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 you know yeah sweat equity they're, they're, on it. Yeah, correct. When they're doing it themselves, painting it themselves, and doing the actual physical work, it would be, they could get it for a bargain. It's not for an investor. It'd be too long to renovate it. So those ones are the red flags. I like to um, the last property that I was probably a little bit unsure about was where it carries a couple of the factors. So. If I, the, the way that I work is that if I look at a property and I say to you, the property is fantastic, easy to live in, you don't need to spend anything, it's ready to go, I can't see any anything that someone's going to question in it, then for me, category one is, you know, you, you might be a bit more generous with your offer for that property because it's a good one. Um, category two is really where there's a couple of concerns. So if I look at a property and, it, and it's about the volume of these red flags you know, as opposed to just having one red flag. Because um, if a tenant goes into a property and the bedroom's a bit small, now on its own, if that was the only red flag of the property and everything else was perfect, it actually probably wouldn't be that much of an issue. But if there's a small main bedroom and there's no fridge recess and mm -hmm. the toilet is in the bathroom and you can't access it, now we've got a couple of things. So it's more the volume of red flags that's the issue as opposed to having a property with one red flag that a tenant would go, you know what, I'll just live with that because everything else is good. So for me, it's yes. the volume as opposed to the actual red flag. So one one quick thing, you just you just said off the cuff and it didn't seem to 
registered with Jeff um, or you as a being a big deal. The bathroom, the toilet in the bathroom. Like, what's wrong with having a bathroom and, and a toilet connected? Like, that's well, it's the because Joe, you obviously that's, that's imagine the you've got. I want to do you've in got my, a family, my house. Joe. I think it, like, Joe, you can't use the bathroom and the yeah um, at the same time. <laughs> So it would. It, so this I didn't is know where it's a big it, deal. no. It, so and it's not really a big deal if that was the only thing. But it comes down to like, and I I like to sort of be able to explain who the ideal tenant is. So for example, uh, if that was a situation and it was a little three by one, and the oh. ideal tenant for that property is more likely to be either um, a couple with a small child or just a couple. Or maybe, um, yeah, you know, that type of thing. That probably is not an issue. But if you're looking at a four-bedroom, two-bathroom home and you're more likely to get adult children living in this property, mm. and, I mean, Great like point. when you've got a 14-year-old daughter like myself who is in the bathroom and wants to get ready to go to school um, and then you've got her brother wanting to, yeah, exactly, someone's just put, obviously he doesn't have four daughters, exactly. And then you've got, and then you've got their children? brother wanting to go into the toilet like yeah that's going to cause arguments so it's about matching <laughs> the type of tenant you would expect to live in the property to see if that's an issue or not mm. yeah well I, I really i really want to get on to the sub because i want to get on the price on the suburbs the things that people have been com coming i mean but before well, we do that i want to ask you sorry good there you go go mate no no you're building this up it sounds good I just want to know what are some of the legislative, um, what are some of the considerations um, that that we need oh. to factor in as if somebody's over east or, or, or yeah, just something like that. Oh, what are but, some but of those factors? Before we, before we do that, I think there's a great question that's come up from from Chris that I think is oh, kind of yeah, 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 ties yeah. in nicely with this theme. He says, in your opinion, what are the key factors to look at when we're buying in Perth? We know some states it's important to look out for things like being close to public transport, not too far away from the CBD, close to schools, hospitals. However, it sounds like that may not be the case in Perth, Sydney side of here. Um, yes. Because there are, some, there are some very, very affordable suburbs in the northern pocket of, of Perth and there are cheaper places like 50, like more expensive places, like 20 kilometers away from those. And they're like five kilometers away from the city, 10 kilometers away from the city. So it's, it doesn't really match the Sydney and yeah Melbourne frame. Yeah, it's um, so schools is definitely a big one. Um, and being close to schools, I think, is definitely um, a factor that should be considered. I don't think it's um, a deal breaker, though, but I just definitely think it should be considered. But it depends on the area because if we go too far south and if you're near a shopping centre or near a train line, you don't want to be near the train line or the shopping centre in some suburbs because you can get loitering. But going north and um, northern suburbs, um, the train line is very well connected with professional workers working in the city. So the, the train line north of the river, for example, is really convenient for people going into work because we are finding we're getting more of a white collar worker in the northern suburbs. So they use the train system really well. But, uh, and, and I'm very stereotypical, this isn't saying that every single person is white collar, they're not. But going south, then we find that people don't generally use the train system as much because we are less likely to get a lot of white collar workers. So it would be considered a bit average to be too close to a train line in some of these southern suburbs because you are just going to get loiterers, you know, and, and young children. So schools definitely, um, you know, of course, if there's a nice shop that's going, um, a nice sort of shopping centre like a Westfield, that that would be considered good. But I don't, from a rental point of view, I don't feel like that's something that tenants would say, I want to be near a shop. But they definitely would say, I want to be close to this school or I want to be in this school zone. That definitely does come up as more important and less likely for people to say, I want to be near a train line. Um, because I work in the city, um, those conversations are not um, things that come up from a tenancy point of view, I'm finding. What are some of the, the main ones that come up for you? Um, the uh, parking is probably the boring stuff. It's the, it's the parking, it's the dishwasher. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really just a simple... Um, yeah, I mean, ideally, they don't want tandem parking, they want side by side. And sheds actually is a really probably a big one as well. Sheds, like, you know, you can imagine a, a, a husband or a guy going, 
just go find a property as long as it's got a shed <laughs> attitude, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and what about proximity be uh, to the beach? And because beach, yes. Yeah, so I was going to say that beach is actually a really good one as well, and that's definitely something that people um, would would um, preference. And while it not, it's not necessarily a priority in a changing market, if we've got a lot of stock available and your property is the one that's closest to the beach, it will be important. Very okay. Yenge, okay. Yenge. Um, there's a little answer range. here to to our conundrum. People renovate to a more open plan, which loses the fridge space, or the old houses had very small fridge spots. Thank you, Anna McDonald. Now we know. And and so what you've got to be careful of as well on that note is that we are seeing that there's a lot of um, sellers where they are doing little renovations and quick fixes to properties before putting them on the market, and they're not taking into account that there is no fridge recess. They don't actually care for and they're just renovating it but, and then the the kitchen hasn't been used so the functionality of it hasn't um, been has been used before so that is definitely coming up so that was a good mention with the renovation um i remember a property that um had a recent it was a guy that flipped properties and so he did gutted it did a massive reno this client had purchased it and when we went through and had a look at the property and had a tenant go in, what it was found was that the laundry had beautiful water ceiling tiles done, beautiful bench top, washing machine can easily slip in there, but they didn't put a PowerPoint. And to get a PowerPoint in ended up costing about $1,500 because they had to either rip up all the tiles or they had to oh, chase no. through the wall of the adjacent bedroom to get the wires, which then involved plastering and the whole lot to get that PowerPoint to stick through. Just real simple things like that. So you do be careful if the property is freshly renovated um, and look at these things. Um, definitely is really important. Wow. You Somebody's mean... asked if you'd like to do a reno. So it sounds like you've done a <laughs> reno or two. You've seen yeah, that. Well, I, so... I have done a few renos. And, um, and on that note, you know, we... Um, and a lot of property managers will look after that project management for you. And I think from a property management point of view, it's okay to get property managers to do, you know, carpets, blinds, painting, that whole thing. I would say that the minute we start getting to kitchens and bathrooms, there's some really great companies that can actually do it in a really quick, timely um, manner and reduce your vacancy time. And it's worth getting them to actually do when it's a little bit more extensive, um, not because we can't do it, but because it'll be quicker for that company to do it and reduce time. Um, but yeah, it's um, definitely something that that property managers do. We're very multi-skilled. Do, do you have yeah. any do you have yeah. any tips on do you have any tips on uh, I suppose if you're buying investment property, like getting like project managing a reno? Do you have any tips on how to make that most efficient? Yeah, I mean, I think that consideration should be taken and into how you're renovating. So I like to say to clients that if you were going to replace like for like, that's not necessarily going to add value. If the property needs a paint, that, that $8,000 you're spending is not adding value to the property. It's maintaining. There's a vast difference between maintaining a property and renovating it for extra cash flow. So, for example, painting's painting, yeah. so that's fine. But you might want to consider if you were to replace vertical blinds with vertical blinds, sure, that might, let's just for argument's sake, say it's going to cost $1,500. Well, that's fine. But maybe for an extra $700, you could actually get the roller blinds. And therefore, we are now upgrading the, the style and the home's becoming a little bit more modern. So, so have a look and see whether you can just go a little bit more than like for like so that we can start adding that value. Same with flooring. Sure, you can go through and you could re-carpet the property, but if you're just re-carpeting, um, you know, some old carpet, it might not have uh, any value from a rental point of view, but vinyl planks will last you. They, they're going to be more expensive, but they're going to last you 30 years. You will not have to replace them again. It's done. Um, and so just spending that little bit extra to do it properly, um, I can tell you that that is going to give you extra value um, from a rent return than, um, than spending it, yeah, like I said, like for like. Um, and, and that's going into what tenants want tenants do um do prefer no carpet as well carpet in the bedrooms but living areas they really do like seeing that to be more vinyl planks so that would be my tip yeah. when it comes to renovating just be mindful or maybe just ask 
get get two quotes. So when the carpet person goes out there, get a quote for carpet and vinyl planks. When the blind yeah. guy goes out there for the windows, get a quote for verticals and rollers. Um, and another thing that we've just um, been doing, which is so good, and I think it only cost about fifteen hundred dollars, is we've been getting kitchens repainted, like the the bench tops and the doors, really yeah. super effective, and it looks That's brand good. new. So good. Mm -hmm. So um, there's definitely change some the handles. Too. Yeah, totally. Those little those little bits and bobs make such a um, such a ma massive difference. Can I just add on one more thing to that as well? Is that sometimes if you are not sure, um, a really great way to approach a property manager is to say, "Listen, I've got a budget of five thousand dollars, or I've got a budget of ten thousand. How do you think it's best for me to spend that to get maximum rent return?" And let the property manager give you a bit of help because you might want to spend money on something that's not going to have any effect. But the property manager might say, "Listen, I would probably prioritize this, then this, then this." So let's have a look at those quotes and. That's how we're going to do a bit of a, a plan for you. Um, but um, giving that property manager the budget to say, how would I be best to spend this amount of money? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a fantastic idea. And I think that people that, that property investors that do not use a property manager for these types of things are absolutely crazy. These property managers are in the field every single day and they see, you know, if you're from Victoria, a Victorian property manager is, is not going to be too dissimilar, but there are a lot of different local tastes and wants and things like that. Um, I'm excited to unpack the legislation requirements around WA because, as Jeff was saying, it's very different over there. Now, in South Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, I don't want to say Victoria, but um, those states are very investor-friendly. There are clauses and contracts and things that you can easily get out of if you, if you decide to buy a property. You can just get right out. There's cooling off periods and things like that. WA is the most... I buy in every state, um, except for Northern Territory, um, is the hardest one to buy in. And it sucks because um, you can get tripped up. So um, I'm excited to unpack that. And then also we've got the bloody locations. What can we buy for 300000 to 400000 What can we buy for five hundred to six hundred and in, in between those prices? So um, just before we dive into that, let's run our ad and then we'll unpack it. The amazing thing with commercial property investing is that in most cases, it's cash flow positive from day one, which means that you can drive those profits towards paying down the debt. There are instances with commercial property investing where you can actually have the property pay itself off over 10 years, which is absolutely crazy. With commercial property, you get massive net yield, so you can expect anywhere between 6 to 10%. And as we've seen in the current boom, these properties not only provide large cash flow, they do certainly grow wildly in value too. Now, with big rewards comes some risk, and this is why you should de-risk your investment as much as possible. And the way you do that is with expert due diligence. And this is why we highly recommend people hire professionals to help you along in your investing journey. Steve Polisi of Polisi Property is one such expert. Being a chartered mechanical and structural engineer in a past life, Steve draws on his analytical and mathematical skills to do that expert due diligence for you. With six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He's the guy you want in your corner, crunching the numbers and finding the best properties in the best locations, along with ensuring that you avoid the mistakes. Steve has actually even written the book on commercial property investing in Australia. And not only is it a bestseller, I believe it to be the most comprehensive in commercial property investing on the market today. He's been generous enough to give us a massive discount for our audience of 50%. So use the code OZPROP, click the link below, get a copy today and start learning and getting on your commercial property investing journey. Can we, before we speak about legis legislation, can we, <laughs> on that related note, maybe this is, a, this is an interesting one. Property management fees in WA. Why, why are they, people have... <laughs> Yeah, why are they so high? Why, I used to be able to think just by my head because the rent was low, but now the rent's gone no. up. The property manager fees haven't come down. No, do you know what? We have not increased our fees from a percentage point of view. I mean, I've been doing real estate for 23 years. They've always been 8.5% plus GST. Like, they've always been that. We actually... Yeah. 
are probably one of the only industries that has never increased their fees. Um, so I know um, that they are a bit higher than eastern states, but I feel that every state has different legislation. And, you know, from a property manager's point of view, and I actually did a podcast on this today, I think we are we need to be seen as such a, a more professional field um, and we have not always been seen that way but from our point of view we have been lumped with the responsibility of smoke alarm compliances working out whether there's drugs being dealt in a property we are the ones that have to go to court and then now be legal you know experts in representing owners you know at magistrate um it, we've constantly been piled with all of these things that we're now expected to be experts in. So I feel like from a property manager point of view, we have so much responsibility um, for your investment, for your tenants, um, and so much behind the scene that people just don't aren't aware of. Like I was in America last year and I was looking at some offices over there. And the tenants, if you default on your um, tenancy, you were breached, you were terminated, You, the owner pays $1,000 to a lawyer. The lawyer handles the eviction process. Where in WA, in, in Australia in general, we have to handle that. I have to go to court. Like I'm put, you know, there's properties that I have to go to with a property manager because of the security. I've gone to properties where I have to have um, a few people present because this tenant's an actual risk and they're there for my safety. Um, you know, I've had a tenant where we're having to deal with the nurse at the, the you know, at the psych hospital because he's not in a good shape and we've had to deal with that. We've had, I've had deaths in properties where I've now got to coordinate the belongings with the family member. You know, there's, there's so much that, that we are so responsible for. So I think from a property management fee point of view, I think we are worth every penny. And I think from a business sense, um, like I know that for me personally, and I know for a lot of officers, we're very reasonable with what we charge. Um, and by ensuring that we are reasonable with what we charge, we can also make sure that the client experiences long-term staff, um, access to you know the business owner at all times, things like that as well, which is super important. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I get it. And I, but I'm finding that um, my clients from interstate are pretty, are pretty good now. It doesn't come up as a concern. Um, you know, they've accepted it the way that it is. And I do hope that we provide um, some extra add-on value than a transactional service because, um, you know, there are companies that will provide more of a transactional service for a cheaper fee um, and then, and that might be okay. Some clients might be happy with that and um, be, yeah, not have any concern. But it's really, um, there's so much involved in it that um, the relationship side of things is going to be very beneficial for the client. So, well, so in other yeah, words, I mean, maybe other states are undercharging. But anyway, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, get, we'll get past that. Don't, don't, yeah, don't, give, don't give New South Wales or Queensland hell before yeah. any ideas. <laughs> but, um, Legislation. What, what what are you sort of finding that's is that what you're about to ask, Joe? What do you what do you want to go? No, next? no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Leg, I mean, legislation is a super interesting one. I think I think it'd be good to talk to the buying side of things. Just just because yeah. I speak to people all the time and they're like, "Oh, you're serious? We, we we can't pull out of the contract once it's done." So in Western Australia, there's no cooling off period. In New South Wales, there's a two day cooling off. Um, uh, sorry, five day five cooling days. off period. Queensland five South days. Northern two, South Australia is two. Northern Territory is four. Western Australia no cooling off period. If you sign that contract, there is no way of you to get out of that unless you have a fourteen day finance clause, which is accepted by the real estate agents. Um, but the due diligence clause that a lot of people like to put in their contracts in Queensland. They're not accepted by the agents. The agents just can say, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do a due diligence clause because we don't do those here. Um, so it's like once, just be aware, once you sign that contract, you're not going to sign on the dotted line and get out of it at some later date. In South Australia, for instance, there's a two-day cooling off period with a $100 penalty, which no one ever asks for because it's just an annoying admin. Um, so you can... Get a contract. I've done this. I've bought a property under contract without seeing it, doing all the due diligence within that two-day period and either accepting or rejecting it. Um, 
And the agent asked me, why are you pulling out? Well, uh, my cat said that it's a bad idea. Um, so you can just totally just pull yourself out of it. WA, you are locked and loaded. You have to upfront negotiate uh, that deal. And I just think it's crazy. Well, I mean, it's all I've ever known. So I sort of don't see it as a, as mm. a concern. Uh, but that's actually one of the reasons why a couple of years I got into um, really working um, as more of an investor advocate because they I could see they were not understanding the process at all. So I felt like it was good for these clients to have me um, to have me give them that extra support because if they're hearing the advice from a selling agent, then the sell they you know it's hard to know whether the selling agent is telling the truth or not because they're acting for the, the seller. So I felt like they're I needed to be on a little team. bit. <laughs> I mean, I, I, one thing that I did change is the process of um, buying a property from um, from our point of view because we the, the sales agents were finding that they were the finance um, clause was there and they were finding that people were doing the wrong thing by making their finance fall through um, when they decided they didn't want it. That definitely was happening. So what happened was now you'll find that most clients or most selling agents will um, say that your finance needs to be done first and then after that allow for the building and pest inspections to be done. So, but I mean, Pete, to, to give people a bit of peace in mind, the building inspections, I have only ever had, gosh, I, you know, the worst thing I've really seen in it is the restrapping of the internal roof beams. So I'm not seeing much more than that. So it's important to know that the selling the seller must rectify a structural issue that's on the report, but it doesn't give the opportunity for the buyer to get out of it because of it. So that's really important. And I try to be really clear with that. Um, and same with, um, you know, the pest. It doesn't give this, the buyer the opportunity to get out, but the seller does have to do a spot treatment. Um, in all my years, I've probably seen two termite inspections come back with active termites. So really a very small percentage. Um, in terms of the structural um, warranty, I have seen, um, you know, inside the roof space. Uh, and to be honest, it's probably been like that for 10 years, but no one's been in the roof to notice it. Um, and, but it's not a big drama that just gets rectified. One thing that I think people should be wary of and be mindful of is that the structural um, um, clause in a contract is quite often just for the house. So if you want the workshop, the patio, the side wall, anything else included, make sure that you have that on the contract that the structural um, report should also include um, those extra areas. So that would probably be my, my big tip to, to make sure people know. But yeah, like I said, I'm not seeing anything major coming out of them. That would be a big concern um, to yeah. worry about. And, yeah. and I think it's kind of the right way to go about it as long as you have um, the right amount of checks done. So buying house site unseen in WA, I think is absolutely crazy um, because you can't check everything. You need someone to go there, record absolutely everything, left, right, up, down, up in the crevices, behind the curtains, up here. Like these in the shower things. in particular, like water Maybe not recording sure. them, but checking, checking them, um, checking that there's no like existing damage because you're just not going to be able to, um, you're just not going to be able to get out of it. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a question here. Um, oh, uh, yeah, sorry, a statement. You don't have to use the standard re rewa, um, pest and building clause. I personally use inspect WA sample one, which covers much more. It's just, will, will the real estate agent accept it? Um, and in a hot market, they don't put too much of effort into accepting your offer because your offer is now a little bit harder, a little bit more difficult and ugly compared to this one. That's exactly the same price wise, but I don't have to deal with, uh, pest and building clauses so you, you have to really have good people looking at doing the right due diligence on it that is um that for sure yeah should we should we quickly cover i mean i really want to get to these suburbs so let's let's quickly yes cover so let's get to legislation. this what's what's going right, on, on. No. are we going to talk about legislation I, I i feel like i feel like we're done with are we done with legislation is there interest yeah, anything yeah. other let's, interesting let's about legislation i want to find the hot spots and the not spots of perth um what are we talking about here, Ash? Okay, so I am going to tell you the trending suburbs. So these are just Ooh. the suburbs that I'm finding everyone calls me about. So I haven't, you know, disclosure, I haven't done any data analytics. I'm not recommending them from that point of view. I'm just telling you this is where everyone calls me for. Very, yeah, very distinctive. So in that 300 to 400,000 category, we are seeing Camillo, 
Gosnells, mm. Seville Grove and Parmelia. Particularly those ones are very popular at the moment. And we are typically seeing um, purchases, for example, around, if they're around 350000 as a purchase price, we are probably seeing a rent return of anywhere from $380 a week to $420 per week. That's the return that we would be wanting to see there. There are always going to be some fantastic um, uh, case studies. I've got one where the client purchased for three hundred thousand and it rented out for four hundred per week. So there's definitely some really cool ones. Another client wow. purchased three hundred and eighty thousand and it rented out for five hundred per week. There are always going to be good ones, but I try to be um, sensible as well and just talk about the majority um, what we're seeing in terms of return. These suburbs are really good, but what we've got to be mindful of is the affordability in that area. So the affordability yeah. for tenants um, in those areas really want their, they really just want to be paying a rent anywhere between $350 and maybe $430 per week. So we want to make sure that we are sort of meeting that demand um, because they can't, the ideal tenant can't really afford any more than that. They might pay it in a in a market um, like now, but we will quickly see rental distress if it goes on too long. So I think people need to be mindful of that, that um, we could get to a situation where we're at a peak. Um, we're not at a peak there at the moment, but where there's a peak in the um, rent return. So that's those suburbs. Um, in terms of the... I'm going to break it down to that 400 to maybe under 500 maybe i want to say more 400 to 450 per week price range i've recently seen a bit more activity happening in lockridge so lockridge is um eastern suburbs and client just purchased there last week um i think it was around four hundred and twenty thousand, and we've suggested possibly a rent around 550 per week which is high wow um, and that's Bloody because yield. Yeah, if you look in Lockridge, there's no stock available. So um, that one's going to be really exciting as a case study to see how that performs. Um, and we definitely still seeing activity in the Rockingham area. So all those suburbs down there, um, that was where everyone started purchasing a couple of years ago, the Rockingham area. But I just would um, say to be mindful there that we um, don't go overspending too much in that suburb because, again, we're we don't want to see um, any rental de-stress. We, you know, families there have an affordability of around four hundred and fifty to five hundred per week. So if you can find a property that complements that sort of rental return, I think that would be um, a really great sort of price point to be at. Um, and just be mindful that if you buy a property that um, that needs to be rented out for six hundred, for example, a week, that there's not going to be as many people in that vicinity um, able to pay that. So. Being very, mindful of that. Such a great point. Yeah, so such a great I, I, point. I sort of see, you know, being an investor as a, as a business, if you're an investor, you are buying, a, and you're a business, you are buying a product, you're buying an investment property, and you need to know who that ideal tenant is that's going to be renting that property, you know, who you're marketing to. So you need to know who that ideal tenant is so that you can buy a property appropriate for the majority of that market. And that's the way I try to approach um, whether you buy three by one or four by two, how much you spend, um, et cetera. So um, they're sort of the suburbs for that 300 to 400 and that 400, 400 to 450 per week mark. Um, in that 400 to 450 per week mark... Um, can, I, can, I, can I ask you a question um, in the Rockingham area? Um, what, what, what's, the, what's the story? Because I've, I've noticed a little bit of... Not, I wouldn't say arbitrage, but yeah, it hasn't quite sort of um, caught up so, as much yet. Um, Hillman, what, what do you think about, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing your expression, so maybe that tells me all I need to know. What, what do you no, think about that sort of? Hillman comes up every now and then, and it's funny because I think people want to buy there. They just never end up buying there. Um, it's a, there's not a lot available in terms of shops. If you want to shop, you need to sort of go outside that suburb. But um, the general consensus is very long-term tenants in that area. And um, and they do stay put. A lot of retirees actually um, are there. So not a bad option. And it definitely is coming up from time to time again. But I think when people go to actually buy something, they don't end up buying there. But they do look at it as a suburb of interest. 
It's also it, very small. So the stock, small. like this is actually, the, I think it's one of the smallest suburbs, I don't want to say in WA, um, but I know it's one of, well, it's definitely, I reckon it's the smallest in Rockingham as far as I know. This is it. It's got, you know, mm. one ring road around it and then offshoots and one through the middle. So it's it's not a massive uh, and for someone that's lived in Perth all her life, I didn't even know Hillman was a suburb until probably about 18 months ago. So. <laughs> that's fair enough. But yeah, it's not, not, yeah not bad. But, um, but yeah, no, I'm just not finding anyone's eventuated, you know, it's not been flooded. Uh, it's just been touched on a little bit. So, yeah. Things sell very quickly, but they're also, and um, you may touch on this, but Mandura, do you think, is Mandura too far from the, from the city because it seems a good a good distance. Well, first of all, we pronounce it Mandra. And, <laughs> Mandra. Um, <laughs> oh, Mandra. And Mandra. It is. So so Mandra, um, obviously there's beautiful parts of Mandra and not so beautiful parts. Um, but it's I, I feel like it's a seasonal area. So we've definitely got the canals, some beautiful areas. It to describe it to um to the eastern state people. It's an area that if I wanted to take my kids for a weekend away, I would go rent so go stay in a hotel in Mandra for a couple of nights it can be seasonal like that so um but greenfields in Mandra is not you know necessarily maybe one of the best suburbs there but it's um there is definitely investor activity and investors are purchasing around 380,000 and renting out for about 430 to 450 um so they're 430 450 per week so in terms of the performance it's not too bad but definitely quality of tenant to give you an idea for quality of tenants um i would find that in an area that was really had a good quality tenant um attraction we could do one home open and have 80 percent of applications come through with great um great references but some of these areas down there what we're seeing is we need to actually do a couple of home opens to really expose the property to a big volume of clients because we're finding that quite often we can get 80 percent of applications that are crap so it's definitely being very careful with tenant selection and making sure there's i mean some tenants but you just have to go through a few to find them as well oh jeez it, it's interesting when these things come up about these names yeah it doesn't necessarily, like, I, I guess a place with a stigma is not necessarily a, a, a thing that should turn you off. I guess what you're looking for is an overvalued or undervalued asset type in an area. So is there an, is there an area that has a demographic that is growing, that has more money, that are bringing more wealth to the area? And if a place, um, like, you know, that has a stigma is getting that, then heck yeah, because you're buying it at 450 but it's actually going to become... 550 um and you know be worth yeah and I, and I think i think it's really important to separate a personal opinion to a professional opinion and that's where i find yeah. that um, a lot of people come to me because if they were to speak to friends or families then their families might be like oh don't buy there the crime rate's high or whatever and you know what they're probably right and i would be very honest and say listen personally i wouldn't live there i wouldn't want to say that i live in that in a certain suburb but professionally i can tell you it's performing really really well so it's really important to separate that personal opinion to that professional opinion and sometimes on facebook and in these groups we can actually see people having a personal opinion and not the professional mm -hmm. and i'm going to use armadale as an example that a lot of people make a bit of fun out of um, the suburb armadale we look after a lot of properties, over 100 properties in the area. And I can tell you that while personally, now I can say this because I actually used to live in Armada, um, you know, personally, I might not live there now, but professionally, mm. we have fantastic long-term tenants and they stay put. Um, they do not cause any fuss. They're generally white collar, um, generally blue collar workers. They're generally one income families. So, you know, it could be two parents, but with one income, um, but they stay put and they're pretty low, no fuss and they, they are there for a long time. So they're a really good, you know, um, option for someone who values that long-term tenancy as well. And I'm not seeing any distress currently in that area. And it's also not an area like we, I've, I couldn't even tell you where I, when I last had a, a tenant in those suburbs, in that Armada, I'm using that as an example, but I couldn't, maybe six years ago, I might have had one tenant who was a bit of a problem that we had to sort out. It's not actually that common there. So my professional opinion is that it's actually performing really, really well. 
Yeah, it's quite affordable. Um, it, I think there's just pockets that you need to be careful of, like anywhere else. Um, what are, where are the hot spots? Where are the not spots to, to be going? But you got it. And what are your thoughts to you know interstate investors jumping on a plane and coming along and and saying hello and checking out the checking out the the suburbs? Is that? I yeah. think it'd be a waste of their money. Personally, I don't. I don't think they would know what they're looking for. So no I would, boots on the ground, Joe. No boots on the ground. <laughs> yeah. well, I was, um. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's necessary. I don't. Um. I think that um speaking to lots of property managers would be a better investment of time and energy. Well, it is a six-hour flight, so it does. It's a is long it six time. hours? I thought it was only four or yeah. five. Oh well. I, I felt like it felt it feels like six. <laughs> However long it was, I thought it was six. Um, I've been a couple of times checking. I've been I did the boots on the ground stuff actually, but I guess it's different when it's uh, you know when you're looking at volume and looking to get yeah. lots of good deals in different locations. So um, yeah, where are some of the the not spots? Where are some of the places? And and I don't think we really spoke too much about this, and we don't want to disparage any places, but. Where should somebody be cautious, Joe? Let's let's say cautious. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That's that good, good, good. Yeah, that's I, a I think way to with it. I think with high risk comes high reward, and I think that this suburb that I'm going to mention, I don't think it's for everyone. So, for example, I um, I'm I'm going to use the town of Quinana as an example: Parmelia, Aurelia, Medina. Um, mm -hmm. I the reason why I think you should be wary of it. If you are someone, um, if you're a, a, an investor who is needing just a tack on property to their portfolio, don't want a headache, just need to add another one on, um, you probably don't want to go there only because the um, the when I say risk, I'm referring to the tenancy risk. We have seen a higher volume of um, tenancy concerns in this area. So, I'm very it's super, careful. It's super interesting. It's super interesting because this is, and this is what where interstate investors get in trouble. And I think this is why, like I, I valuable, I, I value kind of getting boots on the ground because you've got some areas here, Waikiki, Safety Bay, Rockingham, that are doing really, really well. That that you're talking about, um, and then Quinana, Medina, later, these places are just that little bit more affordable. So it's an easy, like just mentally. Oh well, I'll just ah oh, look. It's gone up to four fifty. Oh, I'm going to go over to here and and, and buy, but a bit of a mistake, is it? So I mean, it's it's super affordable, and it's definitely that's why people are still attracted to it. And I, I mean, I we we manage properties there. We've got properties there, and our tenants are actually great. We've um we've been super duper careful with tenancy selection, and we've been very mm. very patient with tenant selection. Um, so we um so it's not necessarily saying don't buy there, but just be mindful that you're going to have to be a little bit more patient when it comes to finding a tenant. And we are going to be a bit more. Um, we're going to scrutinise application a little bit more for that area just to protect you but in terms of affordability it's amazing um i'm from an experience point of view when i've had large insurance claims they've actually come out of that suburb um you know from defaulting tenants and there's they're not the, the defaulting tenant one that i'm thinking that i had was actually not a bad tenant selection she was in the property for three years no problem at all perfect tenant it was where a change of circumstance happened in her life <coughs> That she um that that things went downhill and we had a problem with it. So the I don't believe that the school system's very strong there, and I feel that that is one of the biggest contributions to me not holding up that area in high regard because of the school system. I don't feel is um is 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 as good as other areas maybe. So yeah. while it might not be a place for investors who are very seasoned investors, just want the add-on, I'd probably say those people aren't going to want to be bothered with this suburb. But where a client might want to actually buy there is someone who's actually maybe a bit more younger and someone who actually goes, you know what, I'll have landlord insurance. I don't actually mind if, you know, every four or five tenants, I have a bit of a hiccup or a client that goes, I just need to get in the market and that's all I can afford. And, or um, a client that says, I have 
grand plans. I want to buy five properties in five years. They might be willing to take the risk for these suburbs um, as well because they're buying so low. Their potential could be pretty strong there as well. So um, the rent returns are strong in the area. Um, my only concern is really being careful and not rushing the tenancy selection process and being mindful that the school system I don't think is, is great. However, if you were to drive through the suburb, I actually think it's, and people might disagree, it's actually a very pretty suburb. It's got beautiful nature, you know, bushland, um, et cetera. It's just um, it, it that that's the concern, um, and I feel a bit mean because if there's people that yeah. purchase it, but um, just it's just about being careful, isn't it? About high risk, high reward, so it might pay off for people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is it, is I, it, I feel like we sort that. of took took a took a bit of a, a detour. So where, where do we do we get up to about the four hundred k range, or where, where do we get yeah, up to? Yeah, so we, well, we talked. To, so I'll just quickly summarize. We had the three hundred to four hundred thousand, which was Camillo. Gosnells, Seville Grove, and Parmelia, which is in that Quinata area. Um, then the four hundred to four fifty thousand. I mentioned Lockridge. Um, if you're really lucky, you're going to get Merriwa, um, but also probably that Gosnells and Kenwick. I'm actually seeing a bit of activity um, in that Kenwick, Maddington area at the moment in that four fifty um, price range as well. So they're the south of the river suburbs. So um, they're not um, not bad options. Um, in that 450 to 500 ish mark, we're still seeing activity in Huntingdale, Merriwa, and Thornley. Um, so that is good. And then as we get a little bit higher, that 500 plus mark, we're seeing Marangaroo and Alexander Heights still, which is eastern side. Um, I'm seeing the people that are buying there are buying properties that have got potentially a subdivision option. So that is definitely where they're attracted to. But that price point, um, if we go over to um, Merriwa, Queen's Rocks and, Clark um, and Clarkson, that is still super busy um, with that range of 450000 plus. And then that 550, 600,000 Craigie, Heathridge, Belden are super popular. Probably my favourite selection of all of them um, is where we're seeing the investor activity at the moment. And I think that what I'm experiencing north of the river, so in that price range, in that 450,000 to 600,000 north of the river, we are definitely seeing better quality applications come through. Um, more likely to be a white collar worker in the family. And the reason why this is important, it's not about saying that they're any better than anyone, anyone else. The reason why it's important is because I am a huge believer that if we have potentially or more likely to get a white collar worker in the property as our tenant, we are going to see the cash flow opportunity grow because as the years go on and their, pre their profession, um, you know, um, evolves, their family situation, their, you know, their work life is going to look better. And so they are more likely to um, be in a position to pay higher rents as they go along. So I feel mm. that it's it's a, something that I take into account that the fact that we're more likely to get a white collar worker in a property in those areas, um, therefore the affordability and what they can afford should naturally increase as the years go on. Um, so that's sort of what we've experienced. And I'm also finding that I'm more likely to get people um, applications offer over and above the asking price in those north of the river suburbs because they can afford as opposed to um, some of their cheaper suburbs as well. So it's just something that I've seen distinctively um, with applications. And um, I, you know, look at, we look after a couple of hundred properties specifically north of the river and a couple of hundred properties specifically in that Rockingham area and another couple of hundred specifically in that Armadale Thornley area. So the experience and the opinions that I give to you are based on a pretty good volume of, um, of workload. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting. It's an interesting way to kind of frame it as well. Um, because you know, if, if two people are making a hundred thousand dollars, that's a $200,000 income. It's just, just the way it is. If one person's making eighty thousand, it's not going to have the same disposable income to be able to push up and drive to drive the the property prices. Um, this has been an unreal session, actually. Um, anyone that has any questions, throw them in now because there's way too many already. 
and uh, we're probably not going to get to all of them, but we want to get to get to the good ones. So um, I'm keen to keen to hear that. You know what we'll do, Jeff? Um, and I know I'm putting putting you on the spot live here, but maybe we've got a newsletter coming up this week. Maybe we'll make it a interesting Perth one um, that talks about all of these suburbs, like what we did with Logan. We had a big Logan deep dive. We can do a data deep dive into the. <laughs> Jeff's not happy. <laughs> if you if you if you can do it, if you can, are you if, saying if that? I get, if I write it, if I write it, if I write it, we'll get it. We'll get it. If you can turn that around by, if you can turn that around by uh, by by Sunday, Joe, I'd, I'd be impressed. I haven't started That's the other pretty, one either. So you know how to do it. We, no, we'll, okay. So I think that I think that'd be valuable for people. So anyone that's like, hey, can we get a list of, of these suburbs? We'll break it down. What Ashley's spoken about. I'll have a big chat with Ashley after this as well, and we can have a bit of a deep dive and um, explore these and the reasons why we have these thoughts and, and experiences based Here we on go. what you're the seeing. The crowd is for it, Joe. It's like you read the. Does comments. anyone else? Does anyone? <laughs> does anyone else want to see that? Is that going to be valuable for you guys? Throw that in the comments. Um, but let's hit up some of these. If I say comments one more time, I'm going to lose it. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to chat about this comment here. What are Ash's thoughts on Northern Perth up towards Akimos or Akimos or Akiomos? Uh, um, which... They're missing an L, so Alkimos. So there you go. Um, yeah. So that that is this little pocket. But for people, this is north of the river. Here is the river, the Swan River that rolls through. Um, watch out for um, sharks. Um, but Akimos is uh, sorry, Alkimos is right at yeah. the. Sorry, this zoom is terrible. Right at the northern tip. And can you, Joe, while you're there, can you just see where that freeway and train line currently stops? Just move the mouse just that little bit where Ridgewood is. Um, uh, see where it stops yeah, right there. So that's where the train line um, and freeway currently stops, and it's in the progress of um, process of being extended. So that's mm. really super exciting because that is going to definitely um, be a fantastic, um, yeah, a fantastic option, sort of going north of the river and really sort of bring those suburbs in. So I'm not personally finding anyone buying in Alkamos and or buying in Eglinton, those areas where there's new estates. The reason being is that most of my clients like a minimum 600 square metre block. And I don't believe you're going to get that in those um, areas. The other thing is, is that most of my clients are, you know, real big believers that the way to invest is the bigger block and the older house, where in those areas, you're going to be getting a newer house on a smaller block. So it just comes down to people's preference, um, you know, with their investor journey. Sure, there might be people that, you know, are buying under their self-managed super fund and do just want that new house and they don't care for the smaller block. You know, that's absolutely fine. Um, but it's not my my clients um, are definitely looking for that larger, larger block. And that's probably why it's really important um, when buying even as far up as Quinn's Rocks and, um, and Clarkson, which is sort of like the furthest where we've been going at the moment is making sure that if you do buy a property there really make sure that you're strong with that um that block size because when the estate opens and there's more new builds um happening there as well you don't want to be in any direct competition with them so you don't want your property mm -hmm. to be a similar block size that's that's what i would be thinking of but in terms of the area i mean it's 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 beautiful. It's it's along the beach. I actually um, have a beach house that I go to in Gilderton, which is um, I go there sort of on the weekends. And it's that it's an hour out of Perth, which is crazy because it's like the same distance going to Rockingham. Um, but there's um, it's just it's a beautiful space along the coast and there's not much there. And I think new people that are moving to Perth are always attracted to those north of the river um, areas, particularly that sort of Alkamos area. So, yeah, I guess I don't think it's going to be a problem in terms of um, renting out. It would be more um, about is that your investment journey to have a smaller block with a newer house that's going to depreciate or do you want the bigger block and the um, what is going to grow? House, yeah. the opportunity, yeah. which is which is what my preference would be um, and my way of investing. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I suppose to me and Joe, you probably think quite similar. Um, th those type of it's even like Val Valdivis as well. Was it Valdivis? Valdivis. Valdivis. Yeah. Valdivis. Like it, it's it's <laughs> reminds me a little bit of those type. And it's not to say I'm sure you can make money. People are going to say they've made good money out of house and lands and that sort of thing. 
but it, it's just you are literally relying on on that market like you, there's very little ability to add value to these properties you're well, buying the finished product and yeah i mean that's and as soon as you understand talking. supply as soon as you understand supply and demand these areas have an unlimited not an unlimited supply but they've got a lot of vacant blocks that you anyone else can just buy so why pay 550 for your house when next door is going to go up and it's kind of come on the market for 550 as well like um there's no push and because they're all generally four bedroom two bathroom homes say to my clients is that if all the houses are all four by twos they all offer the formal living area they all offer the same block size they all offer the same thing you're, well, you're only left with differing your property by changing the rental price and dropping your rent so it stands out because there's nothing, there's no other way for the property to stand out except for price point because everything else is the same. Um, so that's that's what I that's what I think anyway. What wow. You, uh, so would you would you say yeah? I mean, I've, I've never I've not considered Yanchep. Is that is that I say Yanchep? Yanchep yeah. and Scotland, Eglinton. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, Eglinton is the same, you know, up there towards, um, you know, Alkamos and that. So the same rule applies with Eglinton um, and Alkamos. Um, and Yanchep is probably a little bit more established, but definitely a lot of new new builds happening up there as well. Yeah. I think that the, the trend will be, I think we're going to see um, very much in the future, people migrating to these areas. I think as we get a lot more work from home um, and um, they're going to choose lifestyle and beach location because they don't have an office to go to. So I feel like long-term we're going to see people choosing that beach lifestyle north of the river um, and working from home. So, but yeah, again, block size for me is really important and I don't know if you're going to get it there. It just, it just feels like a long way from the city in, in Perth. And I suppose, yeah, if you are working from home, then, then great. But, yeah, it's just... It Do you like know, like, I don't, I don't know if, Joe, I had talked to you about this. It's, it's, it's definitely for another show, so I won't go into it in too much detail. But oh. um, the the um, technology behind driverless cars, did I talk to you about this? Oh, so just, yeah, we were sat at the, at the bar. So I, I met yeah. and caught up with Ashley. Uh, and there this. is a bus that is driving itself on the highway up and down. So I was just chatting to Ashley about the, the Perth property market and then I just stopped midway and she's like, what, have you seen a ghost? I'm like, I think so. There's literally a bus that drives up and down the street, stops at the stops like a tram, but not on the tracks and it's driving. Does it do a U-turn like it does a circle? Uh, I don't know. No, I think it's it a just technological stops wizard. That's but, what it but is. But what will happen is as... Sorry. as- world um develops with driverless cars these areas that are that are you know that are far away from the city like yanchep and all of that aren't going to actually be a bit of an issue anymore because you can just get in your driverless car and you can just do whatever you want on your way to work so and then we've got the work from home so it's not a factor so i don't know that's I just think it'll be so exciting to see what happens in the future and and how driverless cars are going to change the real estate market. I think that's the topic for a session. That's yeah, I, 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 my, my investment goals are, I mean, I, I, I long-term property. Buy a but Tesla. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got, yeah. I, I want to, yeah, if you've got the patience and maybe, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm not patient, but yeah. I want to be able to oh, yeah, to yeah. Well, like time to turn around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I guess the, the, the ultimate goal of, of you know buying an investment property is to buy the best property in the best location at the best price. Um, so how can you optimize your funds? So will you be better served in an area that's close by in some of the locations that we've spoken about or somewhere further out that's going to take a longer time horizon? But what can you do with that money in the meantime? So mm. the consideration. Um, Ashley, how can people learn more about you, what you do, what um, SoCo Realty does, and um, give us a bit of a bit of an understanding? Because I know you help a whole heap of investors. Um, in, in, insider um, tip: you deal with, you help out a lot of PKs clients when it comes to finding, um, you know, helping them do things. Um, how can people learn more? And sorry if we flood you with too many people. No, no, no. Um, well, I'm very easily Googleable, so that's the first um, thing I will tell you. Um, I, um, you can literally just Google me and find me. I'm pre- honestly pretty easy. But um, property profiling, I've definitely set up to help people um, be that on the ground support. So in Perth, so with pre-purchase inspections, even if it's just for online assessments, if you just want to flick me a property and say, Ash. 
what do you think of this one? You know, I'll get back to you and let you know. So definitely that support. I, I love doing so. Um, you can definitely contact me um, through email, um, which is, I'll, I'll say it, but you'll probably have to Google it, ashley at socorealty.com.au. So, um, and just as a brief sort of over, overview, I own, I've owned SoCo for the last 18 years um, and look after the property management. But while we've got the property management department there, I think a lot of clients need that support prior to buying the property. So that's where my property profiling comes in. And that's the support from the minute you've got your finance approval till the property, you know, um, has your finance approval through. Once you finance, um, you know, you've bought a property, finance approvals through, I can hand you on to someone who can help you with the property management. So that is probably the, the biggest support that I um, I do get a, a lot of um, calls and contacts for. Um, I will say that I do get messages on all platforms, but the fastest platform is definitely Microsoft Inbox um, because I'm on my computer and I can help you straight away. So just if you do happen to SMS me, I will get back to you, but sometimes it's just not as fast. So depending on how, um, you know, how quickly you need some information. Be I thought you were about to say Instagram there because I think you're, you're pretty big on Instagram, aren't you? Insta? Um, yeah, Instagram, LinkedIn, I'm probably the biggest on. So LinkedIn actually is a really good one. So um, that would be great. Um, that's under Perth Property Manager um, or Ashley Goodchild on LinkedIn. But I do have a private WhatsApp group, which is just for people wanting to invest in um, Perth. I've got YouTube. So I try to put as much educational videos there. I've been recording. Um, I did a recording with a settlement agent which they had some really good tips of what you should get checked on your contract before signing it. Um, that's on my YouTube. And also um, the I just did a, um, another interview with a sales rep from Merowa, um, some really great information from the from the mind of a sales agent So and how to communicate with them. So things like that, I try to be really active for clients and just provide, like you guys do, provide as much education online as possible. And then if I'm allowed to just mention one um, plug that I think your clients will really love, and actually I hope that you guys jump on because I think you'll really um, enjoy it, but I've just um, launched Australia's largest online invest education evening, and that is where I've got every state and I've got my favourite property managers in every state giving us all what's an it, update. What's it called? Of, um, oh, that's un just under my property profiling um, website or under my details. So that's on um, on the 17th um, on Monday night. I've made it friendly for the eastern states. But every state is going to provide an update on um, on what's oh, happening around the ground. Like what I've done for you guys, but in a condensed um, in a condensed way. And every state. So if you've got clients that are like, I don't know whether I should invest in Perth or Adelaide. Um, and the, this is actually designed for buyers agents as well um, to come on board and to listen to. But um, it just will give that snapshot. And then I've got some education with a quantity surveyor and also um, and also a, a landlord insurance company as well. So just some really good education. So um, that will be something that I think everyone would really love as well. Um, so, yeah, there are different ways to get in touch with me, whatever suits them most. I'm just love yeah, I'm, it. Try, I'm, I'm trying to find. Oh, yeah, here you go. You got, yeah, you got Jason on there as well. Jason Wright from South Australia. Yeah. Joe Natoli. Love it. Yeah, there's a lot of people in the group that are actually on your property profiling page, which is really, really funny. Um, a lot of good property managers um, out there. Well, if anyone does need a property manager and they are interested in Perth, Ashley is definitely an amazing spot to jump on a jump on a call with, jump on a message, have a chat with her. Um, they're an amazing property manager over there, and um, they get awesome results as well. Who needs some buyers agent? <laughs> We've turned into we've turned into PK very quickly. Ashley, what have you done to us? <laughs> um, awesome. Um, anything else you wanted to mention um, or, or to note, Ash? No, I have got my notes, and I think I have ticked everything off yeah. on there. So um, wow. yeah, I've covered what I, I wanted to cover. So it's been great chatting to you guys. Thanks for having me on, and um, and like I said, it's all about having confidence with buying and that's really just what i want to leave people with it's um you can you can buy on your own but you can't buy confidently on your own and that's where you do need to have people like myself and also you know you guys as well um being on that same team um for the client that's really important to build up build up your team members when you're playing the game of buying real estate yeah it's one of the biggest investments of your life you need you need an A team around you and uh, surround yourself with them and they'll help you 
solve some of the bigger problems. Um, so you should, you should drop the link to that. the newsletter, mate. Drop the link. Oh, to the, the newsletter. Oh, oh uh, yeah. what, what if people get that get that list show? But um, no, Ash. While Joe's finding that, I'm going to get a bit wax lyrical and say, I, I really appreciate just the insights that you provide, and I sort of. Yeah, I've I've seen you in the group here or there, but even I suppose helping helping Joe myself, but but even I suppose for the for the industry being out there and being able to yeah being able to being able to make make sure that people are getting that investor advocacy as well. So mm. yeah, I think Joe's punching in now. I, I thought I was going to speak for longer. It's long enough for Joe to put that link in there. Here you go. So the, right. so if you check out that, we're going to have uh, Joe's just put us on the put us on the hook for a Perth property sort of overview for this Sunday in your inboxes. This Sunday. I'm going to have to write that, aren't I? Let's do it. Okay. Let's go buy a property. Let's go check out WA and let's go check out Ashley. Thanks, guys. See you later. Thanks, everybody.